Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Mike Mulkleen, who is Senior Director of Manhattan Associates. And today we're going to talk about beyond the silos, the benefits of taking a logistics management perspective. And really, what we're going to focus on is something that we've been talking about a lot, you know, historically in supply chain logistics is, is the reality that many companies look at their processes from a silo perspective and, and actually have their IT capabilities and their IT solutions very siloed as well. And, and in this day and age with so many of the different, uh, you know, challenges and opportunities out there with omnichannel and global competition and so forth, you know, you can make the argument that today more than ever really need to break down those silos, both from a process perspective and a technology perspective and uh, take a more holistic view of your logistics processes. So we're going to explore that topic uh, with Mike today. Uh, just a reminder, you know, part of our goal here at Talking Logistics is to make this interactive. So if you've got a question or a comment for, for Mike as we're having our conversation, you can do so via uh, by posting a question and I'll keep an eye on it. And uh, if we've got time and, and it's a good and appropriate question, we'll, we'll leave it into the, the conversation. If you are joining us as a visitor, just a reminder, you do have to sign up first in order to be able to ask a question. So with that, Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, again, we, we spoke ju just a few weeks ago. Uh, you were my guest here on the program, and we talked about transportation management systems, and, and we kind of addressed the question whether it was time to hit the reset button on, on TMS, uh, and how trends like omnichannel fulfillment were you know, redefining the capabilities that companies need in, in a TMS. And, and omnichannel is one of those things that we, we talked about back then, and it's certainly a hot topic you know, today in, in, in the industry. And, and Omnichannel is, is really forcing companies to truly understand, you know, the total cost to serve, you know, their customers uh, in order to achieve what, what I hear from a lot of retailers and others is, is profitable growth. I mean, how do we do all of this that we're talking about from an Omnichannel perspective, you know, profitably? Um, so, so kind of my first question is when you're thinking about something like total cost to serve, what are the challenges companies facing in calculating it? Yeah, it, it, it is difficult. So one of, the, one of the biggest challenges is just, as, you're, as, you're, as you and your, your uh, viewers can imagine, is just the proliferation of data in all these different systems, right? So if I'm trying to come up with my total cost to serve, what does it really cost? If I go into Walmart and I see uh, an item on the shelf there, what did it really cost me to actually get that item there? And if you think about where the data is going to reside, all that cost information, it's going to reside in, in, in a myriad of different systems. Probably three or four different transportation systems, uh, you know, the international inbound system, my domestic inbound system, my outbound routing and scheduling system. Um, from a DC perspective, I'm going to be uh, getting information from my labor systems, all these disparate systems. Plus, then I got sales and I got marketing. I got SG&A costs coming in from, uh, from my balance sheet that I need to be able to to allocate as well. So one of the biggest challenges is certainly going to be this, the, 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 the data that is all throughout my organization and how do I get that into, into one, one spot. So that's certainly a, a, a huge issue. The next issue is, is um, a little bit more nuanced, but it's, so it's really about the allocation process. So it's one thing to get all of my data um, and, and get it in, into, into a spot, and that's going to be a foundational requirement for any kind of total cost to serve system. The other piece, though, is the allocation logic. So how do I allocate sunk costs? How do I allocate costs for my distribution center um, over time for one particular item, right? And, and oftentimes, this bogs down the process considerably. As organizations go about and they come up with their, their allocations for assets or for sunk costs or, or for indirect costs, it can have a huge, uh, it can be a huge barrier to, to moving forward this process. Um, you're never going to get it right. You will never get your cost allocation right so that everybody agrees, but that shouldn't preclude you from going through and, and working through this process. Um, there, there, I've seen some analysis, and again, just, just like with so many things in the world, uh, the 80-20 rule, the Pareto type principle uh, comes into play here. If we, from an allocation perspective, can be 80% confident that the, that the, the allocations are, are relatively accurate, then we get insight. And, and we can truly understand what the what that cost is, what that cost really was to get something to to that store shelf. Yeah, you know, great points. I mean, I think the you know when you talk about allocation, I mean, one of the challenges I I've seen historically is you know a lot of times companies deal with with averages, right? Or a lot of these costs or or you know the financial numbers are all bundled together. 
and, and part of the challenge is kind of unbundling, you, you know, the, these average costs or, the, or these the things that are just kind of rolled up together. And, and as companies are trying to get more insight into, you know, their cost structure, part of the challenge is then trying to kind of, you know, break it down into more fine detail. And then the other challenge, obviously, is the fact that, you know, a lot of this data is not only within your own four walls, is, is data that, you know, resides in, 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 in third parties. No question. So, um, so, so you're right, Adrian. Yeah, so. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, so, so you're exactly right. So just, just to your point, it's not just information that I have resi uh, you know, resident within my various systems. Um, it is, I have to go outside. I have to, and then it's not just coming up with an allocation. There's territorial fights that, that you see around allocation logic. You know, this group wants allocation one way. This other group is going to want allocation another way because they can sense how that allocation is going to impact their business. So this becomes, uh, you really need somebody kind of that can sit over top and, and, and mediate and come up with something that says, okay, at some point in time, this is good enough. Otherwise, the entire project becomes uh, an allocation project as opposed to what our real goal is. And our real goal is to understand what the cost is and more importantly, the profitability of individual items, of, of individual channels, of individual geographies or customers. Yeah, no, I, 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 absolutely. Now, you know, one of the things that um, uh, I hear often is um, kind of the terms total cost to serve and total landed cost kind of being used synonymously. And, and people, are, you know, ask me, well, I, I mean, are they the same thing? Are they different? So are they the same thing? Are they different? What, 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 and if they're different, how so? We view them differently, Adrian. So total landed cost, you know, that's, that, that concept's been around for, for a good amount of time. And what total landed cost historically has been used for is if I'm a retailer, let's say, in this example, how much does it cost to get the product to my distribution center? So, right, so, and, and this really, it, it, it's useful in driving sourcing decisions. So do I source from Asia? Do I source from Mexico? Do I use domestic uh, partners? Whatever it may be. And, and it does take into account a lot of great things. You know, so, so now I can understand what my transportation costs are, what the manufacturing costs are. Um, the, you know, the insurance, the duties and tax, all those different things, right? But essentially, it's getting things to my DC. When we look at total landed costs, we're not talking about getting things to the DC. We're taking it to the next level, right? So we're understanding what those costs are within that DC to receive product, to put away product, to let down, to ultimately ship that product, as well as getting it all the way to the store, including potentially even store labor. So what is the cost to get it to my shelf? And in the omni-channel world, what's the cost of getting it to my customer? I, I think that, and you hit on something I think that's extremely important right now in terms of profitability of Omnichannel, right? I talk with our customers and, and all of them are, are, the retailers are all extremely interested in Omnichannel, but they need to be able to do this profitably. So without the ability to take into account that last component, and this is an expensive component, that last mile piece, especially on home delivery. And we saw what happened with UPS yesterday. They followed with FedEx. That's going to increase the costs even more with the dimensional waiting stuff. So really now understanding what it costs to get it to the end consumer, that, that's the key for us. And the ability to do that will then enable us to really look at the individual components. So what are the components that are really making up the lion's share of the costs? And, and then again, I'll go back to the 80-20 rule, right? Some products, some geographies, some customers are going to be extremely profitable, right? Others are going to be less profitable. And what total cost is served enables you to do the identification, the identification of what is profitable, what's not profitable. And while it doesn't necessarily give you what you need to do, it at least identifies those areas that you need to concentrate on. Yeah, no, great, uh, a great point. I mean, I think um, um, you're right. I think the perspective historically has been with total land that costs has been around from a sourcing perspective and how, you know, how much does it cost to bring it to kind of the, uh, uh, the distribution center or the manufacturing center. And, and, and that's been driving a lot of the, uh, uh, the sourcing decisions. But when you think about total cost of service, really then kind of extending that out all the way to the, uh, to the end customer and, and the consumer. And, you know, certainly that's where it becomes a little bit more complex now, right? When you're thinking about integrating uh, things that are happening at the store, le uh, store level, uh, for example, with labor, and then things like omni-channel and home delivery and adding that component as well, you know, that final mile, I think that that's where a lot of, you know, companies are, are you know, feeling the challenge. No question. And when you, when you think about the, the final mile in a, in, a, in a home delivery type of environment where I'm managing 
that aspect of it. This is again where um, it is extremely difficult to do this profitably. And how do we go about, and how do we figure out which geographies to service? When Amazon is, is talking about their Amazon front, they're not doing this across the nation. They're doing this very specifically in very dense geographic areas because they're looking, they understand the overall profitability and they know that they're not gonna make this work potentially in the suburbs of Wichita, Kansas. What they have the potential of making this work from a density perspective is in downtown New York or in San Francisco or in Seattle or in LA where there is just huge density. And it just goes back to profitability, right? We need to understand, um, you know, especially in, in retail and, and wholesale, we're not talking about huge margins often. And I can't eat away at my margins by offering a wonderful service to my customer that's unprofitable. Right now, Amazon does a wonderful job of doing that. They're not, you know, I, I looked again, their, their price to earnings is 523 this morning, right? Retailers are not gonna be given that luxury, right? So retailers have a special, and, and, and you open with this, retailers have a special need to ensure profitability because if they do the same thing that Amazon does, their stock, it's just gonna plummet, right? So we really need to understand at a very detailed level when I'm doing omnichannel, what should my price points be for delivery? And, and to really understand that, I need to understand those individual components that make up that total cost. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about kind of that, that path to profitability then. You know, obviously one key component is putting, you know, having the capability to, to calculate as, as, as best as possible total cost to serve so that you know, you know what, where you are, you know which, which, which customers are profitable, which ones are not which uh, you know, processes lead to more profitable income uh, outcomes, which probably do not, so on and so forth. Um, you know, like I mentioned in my opening comments, you know, uh, from a technology and, and, and process perspective, many companies are still kind of operating in that kind of siloed uh, perspective with kind of planning and execution are, are kind of treated separately as are kind of the, the, the underlying uh, software applications that you know, manage transportation and warehousing and the yard and store operations, so on and so forth. Um, you know, so arguably kind of taking this more holistic, integrated, quote unquote, logistics management perspective um, uh, is a step in the right direction. And can, can you provide us with kind of some examples of the benefits companies can achieve or, or, so, or the process transformations they can enable by, by taking an integrated logistics management perspective? Yeah, yeah. The, um, and and, and, and you, you hit on that thing. One of the fundamental reasons we're in the situation that we're, we are right now is, is there have been this proliferation of software solutions. And I think that necessarily, it wasn't the software that came first, it was the way that the organizations um, were set up, right? So I definitely had a, a separate tip transportation organization and a distribution organization and oftentimes an international organization all reporting up to potentially the same person, oftentimes not even the same, the, the, the same person. So um, there was kind of an organizational alignment issue to begin with. And then of course the software companies are selling their, their solutions and, and individual point solutions, um, which, which solve problems. And, and those problems still need to be solved. I still need to be able to do optimization, multi-stop truck, truck formation. I just need to be able to do it cognizant of what the impacts are, both upstream and downstream. Uh, Right now, it, this is an exciting time in TMS. Over the last, you know, last few years, we're getting customers and prospects much more interested in um, things that we've never had to do before in a TMS. In a TMS system, a couple things are always given, right? I always know what my origin and destinations are, right? I always know what the quantities are. We have, we have customers right now that are questioning that. Saying, so right now, hey, Mr. TMS, I want you to do things a little bit differently. If this particular DC is full, I have two DCs that are co-located in the same area, um, let's go back and let's take a look at the anticipated dwell time at the DC. And if this DC is full, don't worry about where the PO is currently destined for. You ship it someplace else. Similarly, on, on the outbound side, replenishment on the retail side. We are, we're running into situations where um, I may have a truck that is 80% full after, after I do my optimization, just by the, by the order quantities that we were provided. Well, I got 20% that is going to be shipping for free if I can actually put it on that truck. So the ability to tie back my transportation system to my replenishment system becomes uh, becomes extremely valuable, right? It, it, allow me, it allows me to really increase that load fill at the expense, of course, of inventory. Everything's a trade-off, right? I always have trade-offs, but at the expense of inventory, but if it makes financial sense for me to do this, I'll do this. We uh, w One other uh, example that we run into a lot, and we're seeing this even more and more and more with the capacity situation in trucking today, 
is the synchronization of transportation and yard functions. Um, I can go out and I can do a bit today, but if my yard, and I could be a wonderful transportation, I could pay my bills on time, I could give them 15-day terms, I could do all kinds of wonderful things that the carriers would love. If my yard operations are poor, if I don't flow that, especially in a live load, live unload type of situation, if I'm unable to flow that carrier through my distribution center quickly, they're not going to want to do business with me, or they'll only do business with me at a, at a much higher rate. Right? So the ability for me to, my TMS system, to work with my yard management system, to understand the labor constraints within my distribution center, to have all these things synchronized together makes a big difference in a way that we wouldn't really necessarily expect. Next time I go to contract negotiations, I'm going to be the preferred shipper. If I tender on a load 12 hours prior to ship date, I might get that truck because I have operations that carriers are going to want to deal with. So there's just that we're, we're seeing more and more and more opportunities for us to leverage um, our, you know, the various solutions that we have in, in, a, in a single platform in a way that adds business value. There's always the IT value, right? Integration is always a huge stumbling block in any implementation, and there's always the, the value of a, a pre-integrated system. Um, but what we're really focusing on now is, is that value that we can generate through business, business value creation. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what from my perspective, and, and, and maybe I'll paraphrase a little bit here, is, you know, companies really need to be asking um, smarter questions, if you will. Um, you know, in response to, uh, you know, what I hear from most executives, you know, one of the biggest challenges is managing change and the rapid pace of change. And, and you know, kind of the, one of the, the, the phrases that I like to use that you hear a lot in the industry is, is the ability to make smarter decisions faster. And a lot of times those smarter decisions uh, involve re needing data points or, or having insight into kind of the broader picture of what's happening. So you can make those those smarter trade-offs in a more dynamic fashion. So you're no longer kind of in this, you know, uh, have to do things always in a fixed way, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, in some cases you do if it's repeatable, if it's predictable, uh, and, and, and uh uh, you, you, you've got a good handle on it, but more and more, the reality is just like uh, so everything in supply chain management, it's about exception management, right? And if you're able to deal with exceptions uh, in a smarter, more flexible, dynamic way, uh, I think the underlying capability to be able to do that is, you know, having this broader perspective so you understand that the trade-offs options available to you and what the cost and service and risk uh, trade-offs are between those different options, so then you can kind of execute on it. I mean, I, I don't know if I paraphrased that right or not, but... Uh. There, there's another example that, that, that kind of hits on exactly what you were talking about, right? So, and, and let's go back to the historical paradigm of a TMS system. How do I make a carrier selection? An outbound move going from my DC to a customer, how do I make a determination? Essentially, I got a routing guide, typically, right? I have a routing guide that says, I got X number of resources that are available to move freight on this lane at this particular cost. That's the way a traditional TMS system works. Well, what about a situation where I don't have much of a staging area, I have a drop trailer program with my carriers, and while my routing guide says I should be selecting carrier XYZ, they don't have a trailer in the yard. My application, you know, the ability to actually tie my application, the, the TMS, the basic TMS capabilities, to yard management. Understand, what are the empty trailers in the yard? What are the attributes? I got a 53-foot reefer that's ready to go right now. You know what, maybe I shouldn't be selecting carrier X because they don't got a trailer in the yard. It just becomes operational, right? And it's it's an exception. But gosh, you know, in, in transportation and distribution, the exceptions are the rule. And, and, and the ability to, to dynamically take in this content, consume the content, make sense of that content, and then make decisions based on that content is becoming more and more important. And again, that static information that's typically, that's historically been resident in a TMS system, you know, a routing guide and, 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 and those other basic components you know, they're great to start with, but sometimes the routing guide's not right for this particular instance in time. You know, that's a, that's a great example of, uh, you know, the power between a TMS and, and a yard, you know, management system. You know, going back to that, that kind of insight and, and talking about smart, making smarter decisions faster, um, you know, that's really part of the value proposition, part of the story behind business intelligence and, and analytics. I mean, how does taking a you know, more integrated logistics management perspective change the kind of the business intelligence, the BI, and, and analytics capabilities that, that companies require. Yeah, I think it bubbles it up, right? So um, what, what I often see is um, I, 
I see the analytics that are that are still somewhat the siloed analytics. I'll have a transportation and KPIs. I'll have distribution KPIs. I'll have a, a yard KPIs, and potentially they're not synchronized, uh, or perhaps they're synchronized, but they they sometimes contradict each other. So what is good for necessarily me on the transportation side may not necessarily be good for the distribution side. Um, so now I think in a more platformed approach, what it really requires organizations to do is, is go back and, and throw out their KPIs. Maybe not all of them, but throw out a lot of their KPIs and try to figure out not just from a transportation or distribution or yard perspective, these, 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 you know, these tactical KPIs, but what's, what's best for the organization? Right? And it goes back to, you know, the, I use the term, I don't use the term, the term is agency cost, essentially, right? And essentially an agency cost is, what is the cost um, of doing business in a way that uh, a worker is doing something that's not necessarily aligned with the broader business goals, right? So if I have broader business goals um, around key metrics, and those key metrics are indisputably good for the enterprise, Let's march towards those, and let's not have specific ones about transportation. Or, or and, and again, I, I don't want to generalize too much because they're always interesting metrics that are transportation specific. But those broader metrics, and especially those metrics that are associated with compensation, um, they need to really be looked at from a from a from a more uh, from a higher level. And that's where BI really comes in. BI has the ability to take information, be it from a platform solution like the Manhattan solution. Or for, or for organizations that have you know the, a, a potpourri of, of, of different systems, be able to pull that information together and enable that kind of more broader, holistic look at, a, at an organization's logistics processes. No, I, I think that uh, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think it really you know starts in many ways to really identifying those those uh, uh, you know those metrics that are inherently you know cross-functional. In, in nature, so that you're able to drive uh, uh, behaviors, right, that are collaborative, that are end-to-end -end in nature, versus you know metrics that you know drive each part of the organization to sub-optimize or optimize their piece of the puzzle, but right. in in the process, you know, are are not ultimately uh, benefiting the, the the company as a whole. Um, you know, we, we've got time maybe for two or three more questions. Um, I just want to remind those of you that are joining us today that if you, you know, if you do have a question or a comment for Mike, not now is the time to uh, to ask them. Um, you, you know, you, you touched upon this uh, uh, a, l a little bit already. Um, you know, obviously, I, I, I assume from from your perspective, uh, you know, the ideal scenario is that you know to have, uh, you know, for companies to implement a single platform that kind of spans across all their logistics functions to. To be able to drive this integrated logistics, you know, management, you know, processes, perspective, business intelligence, so on and so forth. But you know, as you know, you know, the reality is that you know companies have you know a variety of different systems in house. You know, they may have uh, you know a WMS or a TMS sure. or or some other solution from from different vendors, right? Um, or, or that they develop themselves. Okay, but we still see a lot of companies that have internally developed applications. You know, how can those companies enable a logistics management? you know, perspective and, and, and infrastructure. Yeah, and, and technology is certainly a key component of this, right? But it's, this is beyond technology. This is a change of the organization, the, you know, the culture of the organization. Um, we talked about the metrics of the organization. I would start there, right? So let's let's ensure that, that if, uh, if I have these disparate systems, but I feel that there's value in a, in a, in a holistic logistics management solution, let's talk about what the processes need to be. Then let's build, let's back in, and let's talk about what the metrics need to be to, to ensure that my transportation, it's not a, if, if it's good for transportation, it's bad for distribution. If it's good for the buyer, it's bad for trans. There's, there's that, that type of, of cultural issue. Um, people can't afford to do that anymore. And I don't care what technology that we're using. I don't care if you have legacy systems coupled together with COP systems, whatever it might be. The ability to first change that culture and have people work together, I think, is is crucial. Now, from our perspective, as you uh, as you apply, the um, our platform gives you a head start, right? So we have now this 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 one centralized system where all the data can reside, and, and the metrics can be easier to produce, and the reporting can be easier to produce, etc. Um, but it, let's say that we don't have that, or we have components of the Manhattan solution with SAP or whatever the other um, solutions in place. 
in place may be. From a technology perspective, what you just need to do is ensure that your systems are open systems, especially older technology. It's just not an open, it, they're not open platforms. So the ability for uh, my system to take in external data. Do I have uh, essentially, you know, to, technical speak, do, we have, do you have web services that enable data that come into the application? Does your decision support logic then support being able to interpret data and, 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 and change the outcome based, based on, on these data? Do I have the ability to allow external users, um, be they external to my transportation organization or external to even my company, to tap into my, into my transportation system to get real-time visibility? So there, there's a lot of things that you can do incrementally as, as you start building out this logistics management platform. But Adrian, before I would do anything, you need to get buy-in from, from the organization. You need to, and it needs to be top-down. It needs to be, this needs to be a mission. This is what we're going to do. We're not going to have the right hand and not know what the left hand is doing. We need to get the buy-in. So it starts with just that, that, that mandate, then continual communication, metrics that are aligned to the, at, the, at the highest level, not, not the individual silo level, but metrics that are built to benefit the entire organization and not just one subcomponent of the organization. No, no, I agree with that. You know, um, uh, certainly getting that buy-in is, is always critical. And I think if we were having this conversation 10, 15 years ago, um, you know, with the plethora of proprietary systems out there, you know, trying to, trying to bring together uh, different systems was really a, a, a huge, huge challenge. I think, you know, today, you, you know, most leading providers, uh, you know, do have open systems, do have, you know, much, much simpler ways to integrate. I mean, it's not uh, plug and play per se, but it's definitely a much, much better environment today uh, than it was, you know, ten, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, when, uh, just thinking through in terms of the, the, the approach process, um, uh, there's always the, you know, crawl, walk, run. There's always the kind of the big bang approach, right? Um, I mean, what do you see with, with your customers and, and the, the people you work with? I mean, is there a particular entry point that's kind of common? Uh, you know, does it start with maybe, let's say, the, the trying to get that BI, those metrics, and, and kind of have that visibility first and then move on? I mean, what, what do you see in terms of, of uh, if any trends or commonality between the way companies are approaching you know, moving towards this logistics management path, you know, crawl, walk, run versus big bang. Yeah, this, this is probably not really great for big bang, right? This is, it, it touches on so many facets of the business and such important facets of the business that it's probably not great for big bang. Um, but organizations, they're, 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 you know, once they have um, the, let's just call them the, the, the metrics in place, you know, and, 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 and the assumption there is that I have buy-in for my organization. I have my distribution VP and my, my transportation VP and my SVP all working together now with the buyers and, and, the, and, and, and the sales folks. Every, everybody now is aligned. So that, 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 that's our first step, right? So we get buy-in there. But then from, from a process perspective, what we see is people are then taking the demos, right? So once, once I have the, the platform in place, what are key things that I should be able to do, right? And it goes back to, to things as simple as integrating my yard, my transportation solution. We have a customer right now, just really, really simple. Once a truck becomes comes within uh, a few miles of their of their manufacturing facility, they send a wave out to the uh, to the warehouse to enable picking and they can immediately load the trailer when it arrives at the facility, right? So basic things like, it wasn't rocket science, but again, it was it was now moving from uh, this, this approach where the old approach was, like the truck driver would come to the receiving door, say I was here, and then you know two hours later he would leave. Detention charges, all kinds of bad things happen in that sense, right? So little things like that, um, but they, they all start to add up to make a big difference. So you, we don't need to do this big bang. We don't need to, rip apart my organization and put, you know, uh, new structures in place. What we need to do is we need to think about what is the biggest value of integrating my transportation, my yard system, my warehouse management system, my appointment scheduling system, my replenishment systems, and my buying systems. Where are those key value points? And then tactically, you know, and we always talk about this in consulting, get those quick wins and then continue to evolve, right? It's, it's, it's incremental um, as, opposed to, as opposed to Big Bang, Adrian. Uh, great, great points. I think you, you, you partially answered my, what's going to be my last question here now that we're kind of coming up on, on time here. And, and, you know, kind of as a way to wrap up, I mean, for shippers that are listening 
you know, today, either live or, or watching this on demand, you know, what, what kind of questions uh, should they ask themselves to assess if they're on the right path to, you know, toward enabling a more integrated logistics management processes and, and making those smarter logistics decisions faster? I mean, the first thing is, you know, is my organization ready? Do I, and, and what do I need to do to prepare my organization for this new type of mindset, this, this non-siloed mindset where potentially, you know, my transportation costs may, we, we have a company that, that we deal with that has, sits on $6 billion of on-hand inventory. That's a lot of inventory that they're sitting on. Um, and perhaps it makes sense for my transportation costs to actually increase. Right? If I start to do smaller to look, perhaps I can start cutting into, if I can reduce that inventory by five or $600 million, um, my carrying costs go down pretty significantly. And they're going to dwarf any kind of transportation savings. Right? So at, at times, what, what you need to realize is that, that it's not about, I can't reduce every one of my costs. I can't reduce transportation, distribution, inventory. These, these things can't all be done simultaneously. So you need to get that mindset that let's do what's best for the broader organization. Right? And that really needs to come from the top down. Once you have that, then it's certainly going to be the technology. Right? Do I have the, the technology in play to be able to support uh, this broader vision, this grander vision of supply chain execution convergence, right? converging all these dip, disparate systems together? Uh, then the reporting components, like we talked about at the very beginning of this, to really do omnichannel, right? or any, any piece of supply. It could be a manufacturer that's shipping to, you know, to DCs. To do any of this right, you really need to be able to understand who are my profitable customers? What are my profitable products? And again, I'm not suggesting that we're going to be firing customers or, 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 or doing anything dramatic, but at least this information will provide me um, a sense as to what I need to do to increase overall customer profitability. All, all great questions. And, and with that, Mike, um, We'll, we'll kind of wrap up and, uh, you know, certainly we, we've talked about moving beyond the silos for, for many, many years, but I think today, uh, as I mentioned the, in the beginning, you know, between the, 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 the business trends that are occurring out there with omni-channel and everything else, uh, as well as where we've evolved and come to from a technology standpoint, I think, uh, you know, the time is ripe to actually start walking that talk today and, and certainly seeing some, some great examples of that and, and some opportunities there. So. Again, Mike, thank you very much for, uh, for your time today. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, thank you for those of you that joined us today. And uh, if you're joining us uh, on demand watching this episode, if you've got a question or a comment for uh, Mike, uh, you can go ahead and find this episode on TalkingLogistics.com. Uh, post a question or comment there, and, and I'm sure Mike will be more than happy to uh, you know, follow up via that platform as well. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us today, and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.